Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of About Abroad, where it's my job to introduce you to people who have built amazing lives for themselves in various foreign corners of the globe. We're talking with expats and thought leaders about moving abroad, remote work, visas, and all the fun and practical knowledge that you need to know to follow in their footsteps. If you've ever dreamed of making a life for yourself overseas, maybe working remotely or embracing long-term travel, retiring or studying abroad, or even just taking a peek inside life beyond your borders, you've landed in the right place. Today, I am really excited to introduce you to Jordan Carroll, a.k.a. the remote job coach. He is an American that lives in Mexico right now, and he's traveled all over the world, and we talk a lot about some of the countries that he's lived in, but his life in Mexico is super interesting and inspiring, but even more so is the fact that he's literally walking people through the process of converting their skills into what the remote work companies want to see. So if you're the type of person that is looking to transition into remote work or market yourself better as a remote worker, this guy literally wrote the book on digital networking. Literally, there's a, we'll talk about that. There's a link to it. And he's just got so much awesome content to share, both free and paid for hands-on coaching, tons of stuff to share in regards to remote work. So we get into all kinds of remote work nerdy stuff. But then also we eventually make it around to what life is like in Mexico and how much he's enjoying it there. Some of the pros and cons and cost of living and such. So anyway, had a great time catching up with Jordan and learning more about his story. I hope you guys will too. Please help me in welcoming Jordan Carroll, the remote job coach to About Abroad. Jordan Carroll, welcome to About Abroad, man. How's it going? Oh, we finally did it. <laughs> yeah, yes. for uh, for the people that are listening, you have no idea how many challenges we had to overcome to bring this one to you. I think we fought like every battle that that remote workers can possibly fight, right? We fought the remote battles, but yet we are victorious. So <laughs> I'm, I'm My excited. Favorite. Yeah. Thank you, Chase, for having me. Yeah, no, I'm I'm excited too. My my favorite was the uh, the power outage, which you know is like it's, sometimes you just fight power outages. Yeah, I mean, and your and your podcast is all about living a, living abroad, right? So finding those the normalcy in something in Mexico like that happening. I mean, it's 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 really not as often as you might think, but ten minutes before our last scheduled uh, time to do this, the power just went out, and there's no way to know when it's coming back on and you know, whenever they get to it, it, it happens. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was just so yeah, I was just so bummed because we had already uh, pushed it a couple of times. And uh, we're, we're here now. But that's, that's part of what, it, what it's like to be a remote worker It's part of what it's like to be someone who's living, you know, in a different country. And you, you kind of roll with the punches, right? Yeah, man, that's, that's it. Like, you're going to experience these things. You learn to overcome them. It's funny what becomes normal to you sometimes too. you, you might forget that something's not normal in in other countries and you're right. like man i adjusted to this really quick it's it's a certain level of patience and and i th- i think everybody should work on patience with others and compassion and that's part of the remote work thing as well as how can we how can we more so normalize people having lives outside of work and not yeah. just default to thinking like oh well you got to get this done for me cuz i need this already there's obviously a lot of communication things and work styles that you could work on to make sure that doesn't happen proactively. But in a case like this, and even something like that happened in Texas, right? I mean, this doesn't have to be something that happens abroad, like Texas whole power grid went out and people were, you know, it's like, let's, let's consider the, the hierarchy of needs, right? Like, do we have food, shelter, water? Like, let's make sure that those things are good first. And then the other stuff on top of that is, is cherry on the cake, right? Yeah, that that's it, man. It really kind of puts things in perspective. Like I even, it's funny, like you talk about prioritizing things outside of work sometimes. Like I've had so many people ask me with starting this podcast, like, dude, does your company know? Like, are they okay right. with you doing <laughs> this? And, I, and it really kind of caught me off guard at first. I was like, of course not. Why would they? care like you know i I have i have a life outside of work but i forget that uh you know i i grew up i think thinking that along those same lines like work is sort of your 
your only thing. And then, right. you know, if you prioritize anything outside of that, like, are you even really a good employee? Are you committed to the cause? And I think right. the modern day companies <laughs> are giving you more freedom and ex- saying, you know, you clock in for your eight hours a day or whatever and do your work. Right. And, and beyond that, yeah, go enjoy yourself and explore other things. Well, I think there's also a difference too between the types of companies you and I have worked for, for instance, and and this is a good distinction for people out there listening, that there's different levels of remote, right? Duist is a distributed organization, right? Like you guys have people all over the world. There's there's more of a an intentional remote environment within your company that allows people to be themselves, allows people to, to prioritize lifestyle. Remote year for me was the same thing, right? Totally distributed company. You know, everybody's remote. Like the expectation is you do have a life outside of that. I'm curious, you being a head of business development as well, like a podcast probably actually helps doist in the long run, right? Because right. it gets more eyeballs on them. So did you have to say anything to them or, or what was the conversation if there was one about it? No, actually, like I just not, there was no conversation at all. And you're right. Like probably there's a, there's a net positive there. I think someone could argue like all the hours you spent setting this up and it was a lot, like there was a big learning curve for me, you know, like I didn't know anything about audio or, you know, web, even like I had never even like built a website, like a basic website. So I'm like doing all these things that, uh, you know, in retrospect, if I converted all those hours into hours for Doist, it's probably a, probably be a, a, bigger impact to do it if I, if I were to do that, but no, man, they, they're like super happy to see us explore things outside of work. I, I when I first yeah. came to work at Doist, I remember somebody saying, I remember somebody like presenting that they had just built an app, like uh, over the weekend, like a side project. Yeah. And I was thought that same thing. I was like, man, you know, you're, you shouldn't be letting people here know. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and, but no, it was, it was applauded. And like, you know, it's, it's like the actual, in the end, I picked up all these new skills. Yeah. Maybe it brings some more eyeballs yeah. to the company and it's, yeah, it's, it's embraced and like, like applauded. I think. I think we also take for granted that we're indispensable, uh, mm-hmm. or, or we work really hard to be indispensable because if you're not in a position where, you know, you've contributed already to the company or you have that ability to contribute to the company and that you've kind of proven yourself that might be a little bit harder to do as well. Yeah. Uh, as far yeah. as mixing it in during the week now, whatever you do on the weekend, like that's your thing, right? Like that, totally. that should be totally, totally good. But yeah, if you're using hours during say a weekday and you know, you haven't, you haven't contributed to the output that you need to for the organization that you're working for, then obviously there's maybe a conversation to be had. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but got to find not, that balance. Yeah. If it's not getting in the way of you contributing and, and doing your part, then I think the, the benefit of remote and, and companies that prioritize remote and encourage remote and support remote is that they're more considerate of the output rather than the input of like how many hours you're working. Mm-hmm. And they don't look at that. So when I work with a lot of clients, obviously as a coach that helps people find remote work, a lot of the times the people that are coming into this are looking for companies that are like that, that are super supportive. So it's hard to find that culture sometimes because a lot like right now, it's a lot of these companies that have recently switched to remote. They haven't fully really embraced the remote culture. They don't really know what to do. And there's a lot of antiquated systems and policy. So it's, it's tough, but I think more and more, we're going to see that companies are going to start intentionally remote now. And that's mm-hmm. going to just be a whole new shift. I mean, it's crazy what's going on in the world right now. So yeah. <laughs> the it is. Yeah. Uh, I, well, I'm curious from your perspective and I'll go ahead and ask this question and then we'll back up and, and give people a little more background on, on what exactly you do and how you got there. Because I think that's super interesting and relevant to the audience that, that we have. But are you seeing like along the lines of these companies that are transitioning to remote are you seeing that they're, they have a tendency to sort of be a, like, like to lean on tracking, like tracking hours, tracking calls, tracking, tracking activity rather than actual output and, and how they're adapting to that. I, I find that's a fear that yeah. companies have. Are you seeing that as well? Yeah. I, I think one of the biggest mistakes I see is the number of meetings it, yeah. it, and, and actually that's the forefront because a lot of people without you know, without that policy, without that culture, they just default to meetings. Let's have more meetings. 
because if we're having meetings, then we know what's going on. We're getting updates. We feel productive. You know, if you put a, a standing calendar invite every week on a Thursday, on a Wednesday, whatever, and you get your team together, and it's not saying that you shouldn't have standing meetings, but if you're just doing it because you don't feel like you know what's going on, like there's better ways to, to know what's going on. And there's a lot of things that can be covered in an email or some sort of automation with, with yep. Slack or whatever to, to be able to know that. So I see the overcorrection more so in meetings. I've heard the whole tracking software thing and like watching computers and all that stuff. You know, I don't know how much that is, is, is going on. I've definitely heard about it. And I do, I mean, I deal with a lot of candidates that go to a lot of different types of companies. So I've tried to prioritize more so finding companies that are really uh, leading the way in the forefront of a remote rather than just kind of transferring. But, but then again, I work with some people who there's certain companies that they want to work for that are more newly remote. And we can't just discount that, that, that those companies aren't going to find a way to do it. Cause a lot of these bigger companies that are doing it now, they've got resources, they've got uh, a lot of different abilities within their teams to make this transition. And I think it will, there's going to be a learning curve, but I think people do what they have to do, right? Companies yeah. do what they have to do to adapt. It, we're, we're humans. We find ways. Yeah. Yeah. They'll over, they'll overcome that. I see. It's like uh, a lot of companies taking on this approach of like, okay, we'll, we're going to transition to remote but now that I can't see my employees, I need to know like how many hours they're working or how, yeah. how often yep. somebody's mouse moves or whatever. That's, that's taking it to the extreme. But actually I did experience, my mom was like the first remote worker that I knew, like 20 something many many years ago whatever and she she had a she worked for a company that was like that they would track like mouse movements and like if Damn. it didn't move and and stuff like that so maybe i had like a predisposition because i saw on how unhealthy it was like mentally and from a productivity standpoint and i was like that's not the way to do this so i'm loving seeing more companies embrace the like right. the the quote unquote right way to do it how do you think that impacted your view on work and and, and where you're at now I, I think I would, it kind of taught me that like, you can make your own reality. Like at, at that time she didn't remote work was like, not even like a, I don't even know if it was like a buzzword. Like people didn't, people yeah. didn't seek out remote work, but she finagled it. I mean, and she was a nurse too. Like, you know, it's oh, not wow. like <laughs> and she finagled a remote work job in nursing where she could work four days a week. Nursing industry is huge right now. And I actually work yeah. with a girl named Nomad Nurse. She's Nomad Nurse Z. And uh, I'm helping her, I'm helping her, you know, launch her business, her remote, she's a remote nurse coach. Wow. But like, it's huge now, man. Like telehealth is, is getting really big. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. So what is like her 20, her 20 years ago? That's crazy. No, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so she's teaching other people how to be a remote nurse. Teaching other nurses how to be remote nurses. She okay. is a remote nurse teaching yeah. other nurses how to be remote. Yeah. I think that's amazing. Well, hey, that's a perfect segue actually, because I think it's important for people to know that I have on my podcast right now, the remote job coach. And uh, I've been following your work for a long time. Like we, we only recently actually connected, but like it's, I've been kind of watching from afar for a, for a while. And it's awesome what you do. I, I know what you do, but tell the audience sort of what your, what, what the, the, the whole idea is behind your business. Sure. Yeah. And, and I'll start with maybe the fact that you know, I've been working remote for over seven years, pretty much the beginning of, of my uh, professional career tra transitioned into remote very quickly. And it was something that I felt at the beginning was a good buffer for my hangover, right? Like <laughs> at the beginning, that's what it was. And in the process of becoming the remote job coach, what I'd recognized over the course of those seven years, working for a fortune 50 company remote, working for a bunch of startups remote, working for my own businesses remote, was that there was this learning curve, not only the learning curve of, of how to be a productive, efficient remote employee, but the learning curve of finding remote work and how different a process that can be than going to a job fair during your university job fair and handing out your resumes and that stuff. Like it's very different. And there's obviously a, a larger focus on virtual networking and making sure that you are building proximity with, with the people that are going to be making decisions. So I view my role as being able to one, connect high performers to legitimate remote job opportunities through my network. And then two, teaching them a system so that they can create a stream of opportunities on their own. 
right? So, so kind of two parts there. And it's been awesome, man. Like it's been such a, a blessing to be able to do this. And it really started a few years ago as, as kind of uh, a coaching business that I really didn't know what my specialty was. And then as I looked more into my skill set and I, and I realized I really liked the career side of coaching. Like I liked helping people through their careers because I've been through so many different career paths. I've worked in, in travel. I've worked in, in tech. I've worked in coaching. I've worked in the dating world. I've worked in uh, PR and media. Uh, you know, I've worked in like all these different, I worked in customer service. I worked in food service. You know, like that was a long time ago, but <laughs> I worked in writing. Like I worked in affiliate marketing. Like I've done all these different paths and I've done a lot of them remote. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, man, I have such a unique perspective when I talk to somebody, I can really see where they're at. I can really see it. And then I can help them build a strategy. Whereas most people, when they're searching for work, open their computer and they don't know what the hell they're going to do. And they just start doing shit. They just start yeah. applying to jobs. And mostly that's what they do. Most people, when they open their computer, they open it to a job board and they start applying to jobs. That is one of the, the lowest leverage things that you can do in a job search and it's so counterintuitive because everybody thinks that you should just be applying to jobs and that's not what you should be doing. What's the, what's the opposite of that? Like if, if that's the lowest leverage, what's the, on the other end of the spectrum? Sure. Well, I think a, the, one of the most famous quotes is that if you're going to chop a tree, you spend what 80% of the time sharpening the ax, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the very first and foremost thing that you got to actually be considerate of is what am I targeting and what's my mindset throughout this process? A lot of people forget that they actually have to believe that it's possible. They just start going into it and they're expecting the process to show them whether they should believe or not. Now think about that again. They're expecting a process that they don't know how to do to show them if they should believe that it's possible. Let me show you what that looks like. A lot of the time, it looks like sending out a bunch of easy applies on LinkedIn and then not getting any responses back and then thinking it's impossible and giving up. But that is it, very true. It's got to start reverse. The reverse of that is, I believe that this is possible. I see anecdotal evidence within the world that this is possible. I know exactly what I'm going to target based on my experience, my skill sets, and my network. And then I'm working on building relationships. Relationships are going to be the thing that help you throughout the rest of your life. So if you haven't focused on relationships in the past, it's not too late, but you have to start yesterday. Mm -hmm. So build relationships with people not just transactional like messages about wanting a job. Like the biggest reason I got where I'm at today is because I, I did things like you're doing, Chase. I would like create these platforms of interviews or, or content or things that made me like lit me up, but also allowed me to put someone else on. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as you build that relationship and you're doing it in an authentic way and you're actually like having fun, people will see that authenticity and they'll be like, oh man, like I like that person. I would I would, if that person reached out to me and asked me to like, look at this candidate or to connect me to an opportunity, they would do it. So I just focused on networking and it was kind of natural for me, organic for me, mm -hmm. but then over time I got better at it. And, and networking is a skill that you can practice and get better at. So that is the good thing is that it's not something that you're born with. I was the most shy person and the most reserved person in, as a, as a kid growing up and in high school, the only like, like the only people that I hang out with were the ones that would just smoke weed with me. Like that was my thing. <laughs> I, I was very quiet. And then I just had like this coming to where I decided like, oh, I'm actually an extrovert now. I'm actually like enjoying this other energy. And it was through the practice of like putting myself out there. So a little bit of a rant, but hopefully yeah. it's helpful. <laughs> no, it's, oh man, it's so fun. There's like a million different directions I want to go now. Would you, so one thing you touched on there is networking, which yeah, there, this is an, a really interesting kind of dichotomy we're living in, in this virtual world with remote work and everything is like, like I would also say I'm like a natural kind of networker. Like if it was right. a, a strength I was going to say I have like in the, in a more traditional business setting, that would be a this is a solid strength of mine. I could walk into a conference and meet a hundred people and that wouldn't even be like work for me. That would just be fun. I would enjoy yeah. talking with them and exchanging business cards and all that. But in a virtual world that 
it, it's done in a different way, you know, yep. when you're not actually shaking hands, especially these days, COVID days, right? Like a lot less handshaking going on. When I came to Doist, I did a whole lot less of that than I, than I was in the past, like almost zero. And so you have to transition to like where you're doing all this on, are you doing it on LinkedIn or are you, yeah. you know, building platforms like you're suggesting? So how are people networking these days? How are you making and your, your clients, how are they making relationships these days? Yeah. Great question. And I think first and foremost, let's go back to mindset. I actually think that it's easier. Virtually is much easier. And you have to first step into that reality of like, I can do this. Like I can network, even if you haven't been good at networking, the realization that it's available to you and it's abundant and easier. It's easier because if I go into a conference, Chase, if, if you're going into one of those conferences you're talking about, and you're deciding who in that room during that talk you're going to talk to, how do you decide? Well, a lot of it is, I, I think, I mean, it might not be the right answer, but a lot of it is like decided for you, right? Like you, you walk up to the coffee table and you grab a coffee and then there's somebody there and you, a conversation ensues. I didn't have, I wasn't able to filter the people out and get right. to the person I wanted to. It kind of happens like very organically and sometimes not very productively. Boom. So touched on a couple of things there. One is that you can't filter that. LinkedIn is all about filters. It has a, like literally so many levels of filters that you can use to qualify who it is you spend time reaching out to. So leverage the technology to your advantage. Technology is just a tool. You're still just building relationships like you would in person. You want to almost like think that this is kind of the, the coffee table in the messages, right? Now that doesn't mean waste people's time and say, Hey, how are you doing? Right? Like you still need to use again, the technology to your advantage because you have everyone's profiles. You have their background, their history, their experience, their content, who else they're connected to. My recommendation is just constantly search for the easiest way to connect with somebody and start a conversation, the lowest hanging fruit, right? One of those could be when I talk to clients, what we go through is a few different steps. One of those is we're looking at expanding our network. So there's different ways that we can expand our network. And then the other one is how do we cultivate and nourish our current network? So you're doing both at the same time. From the expansion side, because I think that's kind of what you were asking, I would go into groups, right? Start out, start out with groups, mutual interest groups, right? On LinkedIn, you can join a remote workers on LinkedIn group, which is run by Mandy Franz. I'm not sure if you've talked to her or know who she is, but she, she might be great for you to talk to as well. Um, that group is the biggest remote worker group on LinkedIn. I might go in there and I might just use that as my initial filter to like, look through the members list, have a copied and pasted thing in the, on the side of my notes that says, Hey, I found you in the remote workers on LinkedIn group looking to connect with like-minded people. I might scan the headlines, find the good headlines that are like, Oh, that's kind of interesting. That kind of interesting. bring, drag people up five people a day, and then look through their, their profile. Those five people find one thing additional to say in that message, have no ask, just say, you know, I found you in the LinkedIn group. I saw that you're from Portland, Oregon. I used to live there for three years love it, hope you're doing well, would love to connect. When you're doing that constantly, like as an exercise every day, you just start to have conversations. And the idea is that you're constantly bringing conversations inbound, right? Like from that, from that effort, you're going to start having people converse with you too. So that's one way. You can also search hashtags. So if you have specific hashtags, you could follow those hashtags. The goal is also to create the feed that is completely relevant to you, right? So unfollow people that aren't a good fit that you maybe you've connected with in the past. Find other people in the content out there that's good. Content is one of the most underrated things to connect over, right? If you can leave a really, really awesome comment and like someone's post and then send them a connection request with a note about their post, the chances of that getting accepted are, are much, much higher than if you're just sending random connection requests. So those are a few of the ways, hashtags, content, groups that, that we mix in. And we do it, we do at least 15 to 30 minutes a day of the five, five, five by five by five technique, which is, which is what I call it. Wow. That is, I just absorbed so much new information. 
<laughs> and like I'm not like uh, a complete yeah. LinkedIn novice, but yeah. I, it's also not my uh, it's also not my strength either. I would yeah. say so. I'm like I'm I'm like taking notes here mentally as we're. Uh, luckily, this is going to be recorded. I can listen later. I wrote um, a book so. on it too. I wrote. Did a book you really? On it. Yeah. So you can. It's free. So you know. I'm, How I'm do people to, find that? I'm happy to. We can pop it in the comments. It's called the LinkedIn yeah. uh, Networking Quick Guide. It's uh, it's on my YouTube, I, I link to it in, in the video. I have videos that mm -hmm. talk about this whole process. And then I actually have the book too, so they can read that. Yeah, your YouTube channel is awesome. And while we're on the subject, we will put it all in the show notes, but can you, people are listening on their phones and stuff. What's the uh, what's the handles and, and yeah, main Jordan, handles and links? Yeah, youtube.com slash Jordan Carroll. Mm -hmm. uh, two R's, two L's in my last name. Yeah, subscribe to that because I'm, I'm I have you know videos that I put out there every week. I've got a whole LinkedIn strategy playlist that goes through what you know networking strategy. It goes through that five by five by five technique. It goes through what not to do on LinkedIn. Uh, I see a lot of people kind of ruining their chances of getting connected with people on LinkedIn because they don't have the empathy of understanding. Mm -hmm. Like, dude, your message was like a classic example of how to use LinkedIn to me. Like I would frame it and put it in the book, in the, back in the book if I could rewrite it. I haven't even read the book yet, man. I'm, I'm yeah. better than I think I am, I guess. <laughs> dude, yeah, you're, you're very natural. So I think that there's some of us that some of this stuff comes naturally to, but there's a lot more people who it doesn't. Yeah, and maybe. again, they can work on it and become better. But you know, these are people who by all other counts are really good at their job. They, they crush it at work. But, you know, they just haven't updated their LinkedIn because they haven't felt like it was important. But the best time to do this stuff, to network, to have a great LinkedIn, to have your resume updated is when you don't need to. Yeah. Yeah. When you because, do, the best time to look for a job yeah. is when you don't need a job for exactly. sure. Exactly. Because there's not that, that desperation or attachment that just comes with needing something, right? It's like, oh shit, I got laid off. Like I got a couple of months of runway. My family's going to starve. And now you expect to like come across valuable to people like you're right. going to subconsciously be sending these messages of desperation and it 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 just you know having that all prepared i know it's it's like preparing for a disaster right like yeah. a lot of people don't do it but the people that do when something happens it's like they're they're very well prepared yeah like putting the life jacket on when you're drowning is generally a bad idea like that's, you want to have uh, that's a good one. time right <laughs> <laughs> so like one. let's <laughs> let's uh let's put the life jacket on now folks take Love take care one. of that mess before you before you start drowning um, i'm taking that one from you chase <laughs> <laughs> put it in the book man that's uh, i'll be honored jacket. you mentioned something earlier the word empathy which we don't have to spend a ton of time on this but i i do gather from the the from what I've seen you put out there and my experience combined with what my experience is, that's a word that's, that has a lot of value in the remote mm -hmm. world. And from a networking standpoint, the thing you're talking about from a, from an actual work standpoint, being empathetic of, of your, uh, of your coworkers and clients yeah. and partners and all there's, and there's a really big need for this during, you know, tougher times when people are experiencing things that we've, you know, you only experience once every hundred years or so. So, I wonder if you can just touch on that word a little bit more in, in the context of your work and your clients and what you think that means. Cause I think it could be overlooked yeah. by somebody wanting to get into the remote world and just not, not realizing that how much emphasis needs to be placed on it. Yeah. Uh, another great question. I think I would, I would point towards entitlement as like the rampant thing that I see because someone wants a remote job, because someone lost their job, now all of a sudden they deserve a remote job that they can do from anywhere that allows them to travel. It's like, you don't deserve anything. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just be honest. Like I, you have to earn the things that you get. And there's just kind of this, this thought that a hiring manager owes you a response. A recruiter owes you a response. We'll be right back to the show after a quick break for a note from our sponsor. This season is brought to you by my good friends over at Insured Nomads. They're the absolute best in the business when it comes to providing health, travel, and medical insurance for nomads, expats, and really just all forms of world travelers. 
I know insurance is often something that's overlooked when we're fantasizing about traveling the world, but it's absolutely necessity that we address this because often the policy you have in your home country isn't going to cover you while you're abroad. And it's also a requirement, as a lot of people may not realize, to actually buy private travel or expat insurance, as it's called sometimes, to obtain a visa or even enter certain countries. So fortunately, there are companies like Insured Nomads to help us with this. Not only do they have excellent coverage and great prices, but they're also providing a first-class experience with additional perks and best-in-class technology via their app. It's, a, it's an amazing experience. I can't recommend it enough. Now, this is a company that was built by world travelers for world travelers. So they know what it's like to find yourself in a difficult medical situation abroad, and they want to keep you from having that same bad experience. So the next time you're planning a trip abroad, whether it's for a week or a lifetime, check out Insured Nomads via the link in the show notes. Okay, now back to the episode. And if you reach out as if people owe you on the, on the lowest level, if you reach out to people and you think that they owe you a response, um, you're wrong. And I would, I would point towards one of my favorite books and, and I, I would look at not taking things personally, right? Mm -hmm. The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz is something that I think everybody should read. And, and one of the, the, the statements is that we as humans just often as, as our a center of our own worlds think that everything is done to us personally, but in the reality, most people just have their own shit going on. Yeah. And if we can put ourselves sometimes in that, in those shoes and say, Oh, wait, there's sometimes where I don't respond to people. There's sometimes where I have things going on and you have to think as a job seeker, you're competing for attention with the people's daily tasks too, that are much more important than you at that time. Mm -hmm. So there's that, that's one part is the responses. And then two, it's like, oh, well then you better be valuable and you better be unique in the way that you reach out. Because if you don't, if you don't show up differently, one, you're not going to grab their attention at all. And then two, you're not going to keep their attention or, or get a response. So you, you need to show up unique. You need to deploy the empathy not expecting a response and much harder, uh, you know, done than said, yeah. but, but put yourself in a position where you can get a response because you showed them that you understand you might not get one. I'm, I'm going to share a real life example that literally just like has happened in the last week or two. And, and it links you and I together and everything you just said. I get like various messages, uh, people reaching out to me through LinkedIn saying like, Hey, like I want to come work at Doist. I want a remote job. I want, you know, this, and, like not, not aggressive, not assertive, but definitely like it's an ask, not a, there's, there's nothing else attached to it except for like, they want something and they and, don't know you. Yeah. And there's like already no connection there. And it's so I, I don't, I don't get offended. I don't, I don't, but sometimes most of the time I won't, I just don't respond or I'll just say yeah. like, you know, there's, I'll, I'll, I might offer a little something if I have a minute, but like, you know, hours are limited. So you, you generally got to pick and choose sometimes, but occasionally I get these really well thought out requests and somebody basically just recently has reached out to me and said something like, I'd love to transition. You know, I'm an experienced, you know, X at my job. I've been doing this, this, and this. I'm curious how to make the transition. I was wondering if I could just pick your brain a little bit, things like this. And eventually, like to me, it seemed like a perfect way to, to, make, to, to make the connection, but then for it to actually turn into something, I actually ended up connecting him to you and mm -hmm. saying like, after I learned, we had a little bit of an exchange and I said, Jordan is the guy that can really help you here. And, and so yeah. anyway, it was like, the empathy that he showed throughout the process, a lot of appreciation for the little bit that I had offered led to something concrete that I think could, could catapult him to the, to where he needs to go. So it's just like, it's, it's going, you can do this, you can go about it in the right way. And it's, and it's the natural way that it would happen in the real world, you know, outside of the virtual world, if you were actually just for sure networking, that's how it would happen as well. You know, I heard a quote at one, one time, and I appreciate you sharing that because I think it, it sounds just like this quote 
if you're going to ask for 15 minutes of my time, show me that you spent 15 minutes trying to get it. Yeah. yeah. Like really, well I mean, <laughs> like you said, you've, you've got such a, a limited amount of time. We all do. And especially in this remote distributed work environment where a lot of the time that we should be spending should be deep work. It should be not in the notifications. It should not be in the emails, the, the messages, things like that. When you're asking for someone's 15 minutes, you're not just asking for 15 minutes. You're asking for a change of their energy. They're at, you're asking for a, you know, a switch out of what they're currently doing, which takes another 15 to 30 minutes to get back into. You're asking for them to work for free. Mm -hmm. yep. like, <laughs> like when people ask to pick my brain, I'm like, hey, people pay me to pick my brain. Are <laughs> yeah. you going to pay me? Like, like, you know, that's, it's like, what? The, the, the level of yeah disregard for the fact that I run a business, that this is how I make my living. This is how I pay yeah. my rent. This is how I pay for my food. And, and I don't know you at all. And there's already so much free content out there. Like, I, and, that's, <laughs> and that's why I really, you know, double, triple, quadruple down on free content, because I think my free content is better than a lot of people's paid content. And, yeah. and I truly believe that. And I, I feel like that is a great way to help resolve some of this issue. Because when someone reaches out to me like that, even if someone reaches out to me wanting to talk to me about finding a remote job, I don't get on the phone with them first. I right. usually send them the free stuff. And I say, hey, go through this, You know, take a look at this exact video, this one, because this is going to help you with those questions that you're asking me now. If you feel like setting up a call later and talking further at, and, and you want coaching, absolutely, let's set up a call. But just because you want to talk about the issue you're having doesn't mean that I'm going to get on the phone with you either. Right, right. What is the typical, like, I'm sure, I'm sure your clients come from a variety of backgrounds, but like if you were going to yeah. do a user persona kind of thing, like what's the typical person look like? What stage are they in? Where are they? Are they? looking for work, but still have work or they transition yeah. from, you know, traditional jobs to remote jobs. What's the, yep. what's the norm? I, I do. And if you, it's funny, cause if you look at my testimonials, you will see a, a common thread between some of the most successful people I've worked with. I would say that it's between 26 and 34. Uh, I'm just going to say my, the, the demographic that I mostly get 20, 26, 34 usually have, have been, in the work environment for five to 10 years. There's someone, um, I see, I do see a lot of account managers, but I have a wide range of types of roles and that's not necessarily the most important thing. A lot of them do have a job, but the job is either not challenging enough and they're actually potentially already working remotely, but they're looking for a, a bigger challenge. They're looking for a better company situation. They're looking to get away from a certain boss or there's the threat of going back to the office in the imminent future. That's the most of the people that I get. And then they're, they have, uh, uh, you know, they're working outside of their current job to try to make this happen. But because they have such limited time, they want to work with someone who's going to help them get through that. Gotcha. And that's, that's kind of the main person that I work with on a coaching basis. And then I actually have a new offering that uh, a subscription service to my content and also software. So I have a software tool that I'm using now. That's really cool. I'm white labeling through uh, another really? company. And I'm, I'm doing my kind of beta testing right now with it. And it's, it's amazing. Oh, cool. And, Can you uh, talk about it a little more? Is it kind of like a little bit secretive at the moment? No, it's yeah, it's fine. I'm, I'll, by the time this is out, I'll probably have most of this announced, but the subscription is called the remote job club. And there's different tiers based on if you just want the content access, if you want content plus asynchronous coaching, or if you want kind of what I call the accelerator, where it's two month sprint where you and I work in hand to hand, right? So I have yeah. a lot of different options with how to work with people now. And I noticed that the kind of people that I talked about usually are kind of the accelerator type of folks, but then there's other people who, you know, I have a guy who, you know, kind of just out of, just out of college, you know, wants to work remotely, not sure exactly where to go to find these kind of resources, but I want to be able to give that person access to the content at an affordable price where they can use it how they need it on a monthly subscription, right? And then once they, they jump off the subscription, but most, the thing is most, most people in a job search, you know, I can expect some of that churn where, where once they've found something, they don't necessarily need 
the, the, the coach anymore, but I'm also mm-hmm. trying to work my way into helping people become a better remote worker after that too. So once, once they're hired, how can I help you get promoted? How can I help you do this? And the app that I'm using, I have a, a learning platform that I've had for a while. That's not really new, but that's like my whole course. And then I have my own job board that's within that with people that I have connections to. I post the jobs there. And then I also have uh, this, this app called placement. So that's the app, um, but it's the remote job coach placement app. So it's like my own version of it. And yeah, it's really cool. It, it allows people to track. It's like a CRM for a job, job seeker, like wow. fully functional software app where you can drag your opportunities to you know different stages. And then you also have uh, a practice where you can pr- uh, do audio only. You could send me audio for different qu- interview questions, and then I can listen to the audio and provide you feedback directly through the platform. I c- you can put to-dos on there. There's all the templates for follow-ups, for outreach, for cover letters, all within each opportunity. So you can like write them inside that opportunity, copy and paste into an email. It's it's crazy, man. Yeah, it's it's wow. It's amazing. I'm the first coach that has access to it as well. Yeah, I've never heard I've never heard of anybody else doing something like that. Uh, yeah. That's <laughs> I would expect nothing less from the remote job coach, though. I guess, right? Yeah, like, dude, uh, <laughs> that, that domain, right? I got a, I got a good domain. Yeah, you do, <laughs> you do. That's uh, man, that's really exciting. Has that been in the works for a while? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, congrats. That's the, great. Well, the funny thing is, is actually that that app that I'm testing out. I found it. And within the course of a week, I was kind of playing around with it. And then I was like, I want this for my people. And then I reached out to them, just cold email. Like, Hey, do you, do you white label this? Is this something we can make mine? And they're like, I got to answer 30 minutes later from the CEO. He's like, Hey, (laughs) this is like on our roadmap. We're literally trying to do this. Like within the next couple of weeks, get our first coach. Would you want to be that? And I was like, hell yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to reach out again, like the the yeah. whole networking thing. Like I, I do love when people, I, I mean, I've heard people say like, oh, well, you can't really network these days. You know, like uh, it used to be, it used to be different. You know, I said, well, adapt. We got to adapt with the times, man. And everything like, look at that. You, you made one, yeah. you sent one email, you know, like it could change everything for you. I mean, it's, it's possible. And the timing was just right on that one, but you take enough shots, like something will go in. And, and that the crux of that email was, Hey, I've been using this app. It's amazing. I love what you guys are doing. Just curious if you'd ever think about having, uh, you know, any coaches kind of white label this and, and give this to their, their clients. I think it could be a, a really awesome ability for me to help, you know, get, you know, help my people, blah, blah, blah. But I wasn't asking for anything. I was, I was giving them the compliment of yep. how good it was. Technically they're my competitor. Yeah. Right. And they, a, have, and a, they exactly. have their own coaches too, but yeah. I was like, Hey, like, I want to use this, like the law of abundance. If I have this in my, if I have this, if I have this to be able to show to people like, and they like me, you know, they're going to, they're going to work with me. It, it's, yep. it's like a no, no contest. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's, that's super exciting. That's uh, man, that's going to be really, really great. I'm, I'm excited to follow the the journey there. Yes, sir. I'm really curious, like we got to get to Mexico at some point here, but I mean, I could talk to you about this remote work stuff and, and I know people listening are always eager for tips on remote work. So I want to stay on that just a little bit longer before we, we go to Mexico together. So, okay. What are like, some trends that you see from your clients that like, like habits that need to be changed or mindset or, or yeah. even the way, like, what are they doing wrong that they end up needing to come to you? Yeah. If that's if that's fair to ask. Sure. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's fair to ask because I see a lot of the same stuff. I would go back to the, the applications and the resumes. So those would be mm-hmm. my two main things. Two things that I think get the most attention that shouldn't are applications and resumes. What I mean by that is you can spend all of your time on remote job boards, applying to jobs, but if that's all you're doing, nothing's going to happen for you. Unless you are the perfect candidate on paper, which most people are not, 
right that's not going to work you're just going to go into this black hole and and even if you are the perfect candidate you're going to be going up against people who've gotten referrals and who have garnered more trust through their relationships so that's one of the biggest mistakes the second one is the resumes i get that the resumes are still technically a part of this whole game but they they are way less important than people give them credit for you yes. you especially if you're using the networking methods to to get in uh, I've had a few clients where because of their ability to get the referrals into the interviews, one of them got hired by Time Doctor and she she didn't show their res- her resume to them until she, after she got the offer. <laughs> it was like a formality that they needed to put into their system. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Like, so I, my point is, is un- unless you're the perfect candidate, you know, try not to sit there and tinker with your damn resume for hours and hours and hours it feels productive and i'm not saying you shouldn't like consider the keywords and you shouldn't have a good resume but to sit there and like re word it over and over and over and over again because you think that's the problem i have a video online where it says your resume is not your problem in your jobs in your remote job search and it goes over this concept of like well have you have you been building relationships have you been uh, building up your personal brand? I think not really considering how you look online is another thing. Just be, I'm not saying you have to create content and like do videos and do all these things. I'm saying that if, if Chase is considering hiring you for his biz dev team, he's going to go look at your LinkedIn profile. Yeah. Like, what oh. do you have on there? Have you, have you been interacting with other people? Do you have all of your experience filled out? Do you have an about in there? Do you have a headline that says what you do? Do you have a nice picture? All these things, even some of them subconsciously will affect whether or not you get that interview. So it's really important that you take into consideration the networking piece, the personal branding piece, how you come, come across online. And back to the mindset, like, do you actually believe that this is possible and kind of go to a full reset? When, when I start with people, I have them do a full reset. They stop applying. I'm like, Hey, stop applying. We're not applying for another three, four weeks. Let's go backwards. Let's go back to, you know, your belief systems. Let's talk about those first. Let's move into the keyword research that we need to do to figure out what we're targeting. Let's look at your past experience. Let's add all this stuff back into your LinkedIn. Let's create a resume. And then let's start looking for who we can network with. So that's the way that I approach it. And people are successful. Super valuable. I mean, it's, it goes back to the sharpening the ax to cut the tree, right? Like you, you gotta, you gotta put in that legwork and, and this can be discouraging, but I don't mean it to be discouraging. Like you have to understand that people are, you're getting thousands and thousands of resumes for, for, you know, fairly, like fairly generic jobs. And, and so in terms of title, at least, you know, because people do really crave this freedom. And if, so if you're talking about going to work at a remote company or a position, that's going to give you that flexibility yeah, that comes with a premium and it's going to be competitive. And so you do have to spend a bit more time sharpening that ax to make sure that, you know, just having 10 years of experience doing something and being really good at it isn't enough. Like that, that's just not enough. You have to, you have to make, you have to present your case and it's not just through the the resume. It's just like you say, Jordan, like it's through so many different elements that you have to take some time to, uh, to tweak and perfect. And one of the things I would add for, you know, in case it's helpful that I I see a lot is like people rely too much on the resume and not enough on a lot of companies are moving to test projects or application questions we put a ton, I mean, it do us for a secret for anybody. It's not a secret. We've, we've written a play by play on how to get hired at do us on our blog. And it's amazing how many, you can tell and when people haven't read that. Do it. <laughs> yeah. It, but one of the things we say is like, put a lot of effort into the application questions because not only like we really care a little bit less about your resume. We care a lot about what those, how you respond to those application questions, because it tells us how you communicate in the written form and that's how we're going to do 99% of our communication. So 100%. it's huge. It, yeah. And I've actually, I actually referenced one of Amir's blogs, the, found, the founder of Doist for anybody who's listening. And, and I, 
he has a statement in there that he had he had like a snippet from Twitter in the in the blog and it, it talked about the percentage of people that get to the interview process and then get hired by Doist. Mm-hmm. Insane, right? Like so it's like point something percent, like something crazy. And it was just like so many applications are shitty. Yeah. When you see a thousand applications, going back to your point, don't be intimidated by that because most people are doing it wrong. Exactly. Very wrong. Exactly. So even if you just stand out enough to be in that top five, ten percent, which really isn't that much more work, um, like you can get that interview. And in in value assets like creating projects up front, doing video applications proactively, yep. those things really help my clients. So we work on. Uh, we had a I had a customer support guy, and I was like, he was like, oh, what kind of project can I do? I was like, all right, well, have you been through a customer support experience on their site? He's like, no. I was like, go try it. He goes in, he goes into the customer support portal. So, you know, he's already signed up for the, the technology. He's like using the tool and then he sends in the customer support. And then based on that experience, he creates a PowerPoint of all the different things that he saw that were good as well as could be improved. Yep. And for him to deliver that proactively, he had the interview within 24 hours. Exactly. It te- that's some thinking outside the box that can just like catapult you past 10,000 other resumes. And I, like backing up what you just said, like what my, my point there should be encouraging, not discouraging to anybody listening, because exactly, yeah. it, it shows you that all you really like, not all you have to do, but what you really should be doing is focusing on sharpening that ax and thinking how, like, if I do X, Y, and Z, how I can get past uh, like the other right. 9,000 resumes in the, uh, in the pipeline. How, how can you be part of the ecosystem? How can you be a client of a company? How can you, how can you take what you learn from their newsletters and their communications externally? That's yeah. how I got a job at remote year. I was a client. I went on remote year before I got hired by remote year. Did you really? Wait, so tell, tell people about remote year real quick. Cause it's awesome. Yeah. And I actually didn't, I didn't recall that you were uh, an yeah, employee yeah. there until recently. So I want to, I will yeah. let's, and this will be a great segue into the travel, the fun stuff Agreed. as well. <laughs> and that's how I got started with travel. I basically in 2018, early 2018, uh, I was just done. I was, I went through an existential crisis, broke up with my girlfriend, left my apartment, figured out that I wanted to get out of Portland and I left and I left in March of 2018. Now I left to go on a remote year trip. Now remote year basically for a monthly fee coordinates all the travel logistics for remote workers. So if you already have remote work and you're looking to travel to different countries, they'll have like a four month itinerary where you go to a different country every month. They set up the co-working, your apartment, a bunch of the events, like all the different things that you need structurally when you land, it's like turnkey digital nomadism. Really cool concept because for people who haven't traveled before, or haven't done extensive travel, you get a community, you travel in with like 40, 50 other people and you have all these things set up for you just for pay the fee and it's already good. They're obviously picking great neighborhoods too. Like there's so many things you got to think of when you're traveling that it was a great experience for me to first go into that. And I got to travel through Europe and then Africa. Wow. While I was doing that, I'm within this community environment i'm doing presentations for the rest of the group i'm connecting with all the employees at remote year you know i'm becoming known within the organization as someone who you know there's there's less of a distinction between the clients and the employees because we're all together we're all traveling together it's like a it's a very informal thing it's fun right and from the first month i was there i was asking people that work there i was taking them aside And I was like, Hey, you know, like, I really appreciate the time spending with me here and please let me know how I can be a help of you. I'm really interested in working at remote year. I want to be a program consultant. I think I'd be great for it. Here's all the reasons why. Can you tell me a little bit more about, you know, the day in the life so I can just really understand that. And I would, I would continue to have these informational interviews while also providing a ton of value. Like I would introduce new people to remote year. I would, I would do those presentations. I'd help program leaders, I would always put myself in a position where they could see that I really cared. By the end of the four months, 
that job had, had you know had an opening there was two people who submitted my resume before i even knew it was open i didn't apply at all interview was are already you know booked and then i i interviewed for i don't know like two or three weeks and then got hired and then i moved to mexico city so i was traveling through you know, Europe at that time, I ended in Africa, I was in Cape Town, uh, South Africa, and they flew me out to Mexico City for training. I spent three months there and then ended up continuing on another program where I, I was working as a con program consultant in sales. So I was able to travel with the programs and I had a discount on that too, which was pretty great. And, but I had no responsibility to that immediate group. So I could pop in and out and I could hang out with people. And I was a little bit more removed than someone who was on the trip actually kind of guiding everybody. So amazing, amazing experience. <laughs> so much fun, man. Did, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but so remote year comes through here to Valencia and I don't yeah. know, did you, did you come through Valencia on, I, on your trip? I, so I went on a four month trip and then I started on a 12 month trip, spent three initial months with them and then met them for another two months later. And then one of the places I did was Valencia on the way to the Nomad cruise because the Nomad cruise left from Barcelona. So I started uh, in Valencia, went to Barcelona, and then I left on Nomad cruise, which is another, you know, nomad community. I've got kind of, I've kind of put yeah. my, <laughs> my feet in a lot of these nomadic communities and it's just great because you end up like, I'm here in Playa del Carmen now and I moved to Mexico full time in January of 2020 before all the madness. And <laughs> everyone's here now. Like there's just so many people from those communities, remote year, nomad crews that have moved here and have seen like, Oh wow. Like this is a really legit place to live. Yeah. And I just, it, it continues to grow the, you know, the local community as well, which is awesome. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I love that, that element of community that exists within like the nomad community. Like I, that, that's what I was yeah. going to say actually, is that the remote year was coming through here and I would occasionally like meet up with some of the the organizers and such, yep. go out and have a drink or something and uh, meet some of the people that were just here for a short period of time. But, and, and then also you'd kind of start to notice, like sometimes I'd see I'd, like, oh, there's a new group of remote years here. Um, yeah. So anyway, it's a, it's a super cool program and I'm glad to see they've had a, a revamp again, sort of, it looks yeah, like. Yeah, they and, just, and just are, started back up. Yeah, sort of, because I mean, COVID obviously made that very challenging, right but um. That. I'm glad to see them making a, making a comeback because it's a super cool concept. It, yeah, it's, it's great. And they were, they were bought by Selena and that was one of the big reasons why they could continue. And I actually pretty integrated into Selena. I had won the Mexico nomad road trip, which was a competition a couple of years ago. What's that? Um, it, so there was a competition that Selena, it's a chain of hostels. They were running this like online social media competition and you basically had to do a challenge every week for a month one of them was send out whoever can get as many people to apply to their positions as possible gets a certain number of points right whoever can throw a charity event in a week and and take pictures of it and do that gets a certain amount of points and so every week there's these challenges and this goes back to your whole thing man it's like there was maybe 300 people to Three, 300 to 500 people who entered and literally by the time it was done, there was maybe only 10 to 20 people. <laughs> yeah. Because people give up, man. And it's the same thing as the job search. It's like, if you see a thousand people, it's like maybe 50 of those applications, a hundred of those applications are decent. Then there's, then there's absolutely you know, even deviations in those. So I actually, I, I won that road trip and it took me for two weeks from Puerto Escondido to Cancun and Playa del Carmen. The reason I mentioned this is because that was the first time I'd been to Playa del Carmen. Wow. And we ended at the Nomad Summit, which is another conference for nomads. And we, we got to be part of a panel interview and it was like a cool thing. But then I found Playa and I found my girlfriend, my current girlfriend in that trip. And then three months later moved here. So it was wow. just kind of, you know, when, you, when it feels right, it feels right. And that's part of this whole like moving abroad thing is I think if you talk to a lot of, you know, folks that have done extensive travel, I've been to 15 countries in three years and, you know, lived in those countries for at least a month to three months each. But when you, when you eventually run out of that steam and you're like, Hey, I need to like 
find my people. I need to like find my place. And then it happens. It's just such a huge, huge thing. So I'm sure is that. Yeah. It, oh, uh, it resonates. I mean, on so many levels, it resonates with me and in, in my, my history and stops that I made as well. And yeah, when you find that place, it's uh, and, and then your community within that place, it feels like that much more rewarding because you know you're, it's kind of unexpected, right? Like you're yeah. you're you're on a nomad journey. You're gonna you're gonna keep on moving, and then all of a sudden you stop and you put your feet down for a second, and you're like, oh, I might just I might just chill here. Wait a second. <laughs> this is pretty uh, yeah. nice. <laughs> well, what is it? So what is it about Playa del Carmen? Because I think like I you, you just you said something that that triggered something in my head, like people are realizing Playa del Carmen is a sweet place to live. And I think the stereotype may have been to kind of lump it in like as, as Cancun, like, Oh, that's where you go for spring break when you're in college. Or that's like uh, where if you want an all inclusive, like that's a place to go. But I'm hearing more and more people like you say, this is an awesome place to live. And I would love to pick your brain on that. Yeah. So when I think of my criteria at the time, I was nearing the end of two years of straight travel, sometimes two weeks into a new city, most of the time, at least one month and then a new city. But man, that just gets so tiring, right? You can't, Mm -hmm. you can't sustain that. And I think my business, my work life, my personal life, all in this, they were kind of in this transient nature. And, and this is the, the, the stuff that most people don't talk about, but when you go to a new place like that all the time, you have to figure out where you're going to get groceries. You have to figure out, you know, are you going to go to a cafe locally to work? How's the internet at the place that you're at? Where's the gym? Are you going to go to a gym? And you got to reset that every month. It is so hard, man. Uh, It just, it's draining. It's exhausting. So for me, I was looking for a place in Mexico because the time zones you know, it's obviously very close to the U.S. I can get back very easily if I needed to visit my, my folks. I wanted to be near a beach. I'd spent a lot of time in Medellin, Colombia, which is awesome, but there's no beach. I'm a, I'm a water guy. I, I actually don't do water sports or anything like that. I just love being near the water. It's just calming. So I wanted to be near a beach. I wanted to continue to practice Spanish and, and become as, you know, heavier and conversational, you know, I'm probably light conversational now, but I wanted to, you know, continue to extend that. And then the other things that really stand out about Playa, it's walkable. You can walk anywhere. You don't need a car. You don't even need a bike. If you do need a bike, they have rental bikes, 400 pesos for an entire year. And it's, what's that? What's 400 pesos like in dollars? What are we talking? Dude, like, divide by 20. So what's that? 20 bucks? <laughs> yeah. 20 bucks. <laughs> yeah. Amazing for the for year. year of rental bikes, unlimited use. Wow. And they're, um, and they're well positioned too. Like, like yeah, uh, there's, all there's over, plenty of them. Yeah. All nice. over the city. Yep. Super easy. So to so that factor of being able to get there and get there. And then the factor of being able to step outside of the crazy tourist part and, and even, you know, there's one street here that's very loud, vibrant, a lot of foot traffic with tourism. But outside of that, you can get to other places that um, are not as uh, heavy traffic. And, and, and sometimes you obviously don't want to be in the, those kind of streets because it's just frustrating. Last thing, basketball is huge here. Like I'm a huge basketball guy. There's, there's a free court where they have basketball courts tennis courts, a track, a Zumba area, an outdoor gym free. Wow. <laughs> and it's amazing. It's, it's a, an amazing facility and it's actually the professional soccer team plays there too. So it's got all these resources and it's right in the middle of the city walkable. Like I can get there in a six minute walk from my, my place and there's two basketball courts. And, and for me, that was huge. It's like being able to play and go lift or, or do all these things. It just has everything accessible and then the food is, is out yeah. of the world. Uh, cost, I'd, I'd, I mean, I, cost, like <laughs> in Mexico, like you definitely, you have some arbitrage with, with the US dollar. So some, some people I've had this question asked multiple times now through, through having released some of these episodes. And so I don't, I don't want to put too much emphasis on cost of living, but people are curious. Like, so can you give yeah. some rough, rough estimates on like, you know, like, uh, 
what's a what's a beer like what's a coffee like what's a yeah. lunch and rent you know or something like that yeah i i don't drink so i i don't know if i tell you about a beer but i'm assuming it's like probably a buck or two <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, yeah food i mean so i have a meal service that comes delivers my food every day it's it's around six bucks a meal for for that food delivery and it's it's really really good high quality stuff but you can go to a street taco vendor over here and and get five tacos for a dollar if you really want oh my god you're killing me uh, man yeah rent rent wise is is great too i mean i'm in a two bedroom and we're paying 1200 us total for a two bedroom in in a pretty nice condo with the the pool and the jacuzzis outside and you know let's see if i can the beautiful mexican beaches right around the corner not to mention oh it's uh yeah it's about i'm about a five minute three to five minute walk to the beach beautiful down wow i can take the blur off and maybe even show you a little bit of the outside there so, oh man listeners you can't you can't see you're uh, not, yes, you're not uh no but the, you you know I, this is perks of of my job i get to see these things you don't yeah <laughs> um that's uh that's great what about like you feel like you have access to things that maybe would be on the fringe of necessity like i don't know if you need uh, special supplements or medicine or access to certain types of doctors, stuff like that. Like what's that, what's that area? Well, dude, healthcare. It's so funny. Healthcare here is so easy. There's clinics that you can go to that are private where I did like a whole lab screen. I actually, (laughs) this is something that I don't want this to deter people, but I actually last year when I was in Oaxaca, I got an infection from like kind of a, a parasitic uh, <laughs> parasitic bacteria. And it could it happen popped. anywhere. Uh, yeah, but it was you know I ate some some meat and some cheese from this uh, mezcaleria that I was at during that road trip I was telling you about, mm-hmm. and it was old or it was out in the sun. It was it was spoiled or something, and uh, I ended up having to go to a clinic to get an- antibiotics and getting all these blood tests and all this other stuff, and I was out maybe sixty to eighty bucks total. Wow. for like a trip to the private can you imagine man in the u.s what that would cost unreal, oh my God. Dude. it would have been crazy even with so, insurance and i walked in i just walked into this it was kind of a it wasn't urgent care but it was a, a clinic that provide pretty quick care and he went in did all the tests gave me the antibiotics yeah 60 80 bucks tops wow. and super easy i mean if you need to speak English, it's available. There's a Walmart down here. Like if you is need there to go, really? Yeah, yeah. If you need to go to Walmart, it's a 15 minute walk. Oh, that way. Um, Applications so, to Mexico are going to start flooding once Americans learn that there's Walmart. There's I mean, Walmart. They're like, oh, what else do you need? I'm I'm good. I got Walmart. <laughs> They've got you know other mega suit. You know, they got well, Soriano Mega, which is another uh, superstore. Dude, everything's everything's here. Uh, I'm trying to think of other kind of practical Amazon. Like mm-hmm. you can ship Amazon US here. It just has to be able to come to Mexico. And then you, they just add on the the, uh, the 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 fees, like the tariff or whatever. Mm-hmm. And super reasonable. Like I've gotten a ton of shipments from Amazon here. So you don't even That's have it. to sacrifice that. That's an interesting thing. In Spain, they have uh, Amazon Spain. It's like Amazon.es. Right. You could do and Amazon, You could do- They have Amazon Mexico too? Amazon Mexico. But the okay. problem with that is that I needed a Mexican credit card. Yeah. I couldn't get it to work with my other one. So I, I order from the U S with the ability to ship to Mexico and then they just charge the fee for bringing uh, it. Okay. That, so, so Amazon Spain is, is fairly limited in comparison to like amazon.com, like Amazon yeah. from the U S but you can't, if you, you may be able to ship something from through it. Like I have an Amazon account back in the U S you may be able to order something there and then have it sent to Spain, but it would cost the import fees are insane. Yeah. So anyway, you just end up using Amazon, Amazon Spain, but that that's really cool that you can send to yeah. Mexico from, from the U S that's a big perk. Yeah. No, the bus up to Cancun is 45 minutes and it costs uh, five bucks, eight bucks. Wow. And it's super comfortable, like nice bus leaves on time. Uh, so it's really easy to get to the airport. Yeah, dude. I mean, I, I have a I have a boxing coach down here. I've got a basketball coach. I've got a ukulele instructor. I like wow. you can find the people that you need. And 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 I'll I'll say this: if I were to pay for all those types of trainers and coaches in the U.S., I would only be able to probably afford one. Right. But with the cost of living here, you know, 
people make a decent living with less. And it's, yeah, yeah, exactly. So you can afford to round out some, some interests there and like exactly. explore some new things. And yeah, it's uh, I mean, it's a big perk. Like it's in, and it's not taking advantage. I mean, you're, you're investing into the economy there. You're hiring those people who are living there and they're, they're benefiting from it. So like, this is where I think, the whole not to get on my soapbox, but you know, like the whole like remote revolution and digital nomads and people who want to explore other countries. Like sometimes people, I, I hear this from people like, oh, you're just going there to like take advantage of the low cost of living or whatever. And I, I think that's like a huge cop out because it's like, no, man, you're, these people are going to experience the culture and invest, inject economically into the, right. into the society there. But also like you learn so much along the way you get to you, I mean, it just, it, it can broaden the horizons for multiple people and there's a ripple effect there. I think to, to that point, it depends on, on, on you, right? Yeah. It's, it's up to the individual to be a contributor to that society, to be a contributor to that community. You know, for me, I, I, I really try to, to, well, one, I speak Spanish everywhere I go. And I think from a very basic perspective, if you're going to be living longer term in a, in a country, learn the language or, or try to use the language. It, it's just the, the sign of respect when people go somewhere and they, they insist that English has to be spoken in a country where English is not the primary language, you are disrespecting that culture. You, you are putting yourself in a position where you're, cha you're changing the fundamental nature of that culture because you feel like you're superior in some way. Yeah. So I, and that, some of that's unconscious stuff. I mean, I know it's not always on purpose, but that's one thing that I would say is just from a very basic perspective is trying to use the language and then also being considerate, like how much are you potentially pushing people out of, of affordable, but then how much are you contributing to the local economy? How much are you buying from the small mm -hmm. stores here? I try to not go to Walmart if I don't need to, right? right. Like it, it gets kind of last, if, if nothing, nowhere else has this place, I'll, I'll much rather first, there's a, a fruiteria around the, the block, just am, like amazing juices and fruit and all this stuff. Like I go there as much as I can because it's, you know, it's a hole in the wall fruiteria. And if you can support those, those with local, you know, an injection of local support with, with yeah. your currency, like that can be a huge help. Yeah, totally. And that's how you get the most out of your experience too, right? Like, like sure, walking over yeah. to the local taco stand and getting five tacos for a, for a buck and a little fruit juice from, from somebody on the corner there. Like that, that should just bring you so much joy, right? Like this is like that just going to get tacos and a fruit juice is like a fun experience, <laughs> you know, going to the, yeah. the local equivalent of the, of the Walmart and like, is like, that becomes a cool experience. That's what, that's what makes it fun. Yeah. A hundred percent. And in, I, I actually have a video. My main video on my page on my YouTube is about living in Playa and, mm. and about living in Mexico. So um, that might be something we can link because I think if people want to want to see what, what we're talking about, I think that's a better visual representation. Definitely. Yeah, we should. Uh, we'll, we'll add that to the show notes as well. So people can get the quick synopsis uh, video style. <laughs> Yeah. What, um, I'm curious with, uh, like, are, are there any other places in Mexico that you would consider living or is like Playa del Carmen just like uh, far and away number one? Well, yeah, we got to remember my, I met my girlfriend here too. You've been here for like five years. She's from Northern Mexico, different part. I've heard, I, and I haven't been to Merida, but mm -hmm. I've heard a lot of great things about there. Oaxaca is also really cool. I don't hold the grudge against uh, getting sick there. <laughs> Mexico City is great. I live there as well. I, I think it depends on what you want, right? Mm -hmm. For the beach town atmosphere, for the accessibility, for the ability, like I could pop down to Tulum as well, which is, yeah, you know, 40 minutes south. I can get there for three, four dollars to awesome. Tulum. I wouldn't live in Tulum. Tulum doesn't have the infrastructure that Playa has, but just being in proximity, I think that makes Playa, you know, a great option and being close to Cancun as well. Also wouldn't live in Cancun. I wouldn't, I don't really go there, right. but it's, uh, you know, things are close. 
So I think that's important. And on, on this side, it's great. There's also, if you're into like surfing beach towns, like smaller towns, Sailita mm -hmm. and Puerto Escondido, I hear are great. I've been to Puerto Escondido, had some trouble with the Wi-Fi. So I got to I gotta tell you, man, having a place that's really consistent with Wi-Fi, other than the power outage we experienced the other week, yeah, right. uh, it, it's mostly but pretty consistent. Nice. That's great. I've, I will say we, we went to Tulum for my wife's birthday several years ago and I, I loved it. Like I get, like I wouldn't, I also wouldn't necessarily want to live there cause I think you're missing some infrastructure, like you said, but very yeah. cool place to, uh, to visit. Yeah. Good for pop down for a day for a weekend, Yeah, you know, you leave your phone in the room. You don't even really need it. Just kind of explore a little bit. It's, it's cool. <laughs> it's also really expensive. Like, uh, yeah, I mean, Tulum prices rival like New York. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's, it's, it's not cheap. You know? I mean, it's a, it's a shock to people. You get there and you're like, Oh, yeah. you're like, like you wait, said. where am I? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, we, we've like, I feel like we could keep talking for hours. I know I got to let you go here soon. So I'll try to wrap this up quickly. One, one thing I wanted to touch on was just from the visa standpoint and the ability to stay yeah. in Mexico what is the, what was the process like as an American for, to, or, or what, or what do you have to do in order to stay there? Yeah. So, and I'll give kind of disclosure. I am a temporary resident mm -hmm. here in Mexico. I made the decision to pursue that residency after deciding this is where I want to be long-term. So it's, it's definitely not necessary if you're just going to be coming for a little while and then leaving, but there are some advantages now when I think of that process for me and for most people that go through it, you, you need to qualify one in a few ways. One is a, a, a monetary proof of, of income in a bank account. It does not need to be a Mexican bank account, but it needs to be in a bank account for, a, for 12 months. So you can either show that, you can have a Mexican bloodline. So I think sister or uh, parents or whatever, or have a child. Hmm. Those are the ways that you kind of get qualify for residency. And then the process was you need to go to a consulate in the country, a Mexican consulate in the country in which you are naturalized. So mm -hmm. for me, that was the US. I went to Miami and that was, I, I had to set up an appointment with the immigration officers in Miami, went to Miami over the course of a day. I went to the interview in the morning and I got my approval in the afternoon. So it was very quick, relatively I mean, there's an application fee, which was, it was like 40 bucks. Mm -hmm. And then there was lawyer fees, which I paid. And within, so, so if I added all the travel, the lawyer fees, the taxes, and then the, the application fee, uh, I was probably out maybe six, six or $700 total, but you could do it for less if you really wanted to, because I obviously had the lawyer involved, which made it easier. And then there was maybe a three month process in between that happening. And then me finally getting my card. We had to, I did go back to immigration a couple of times and really, I mean, the worst part of it was the interview, the immigration interview. It's they just, do an interview. Immigration officers are just not, they're trained, not always the most friendly of folks. They're trained to try to make you crack. Like that's yeah. what, what I've come to see. And man, it was just, it was an unworldly experience. I was like, the guy was just so mean. <laughs> I hadn't, I hadn't had an encounter with another human that was that unpleasant. Wow. Like, really. like what was he like just grilling you or? Yeah. And just super condescending. And, you know, I got there and I didn't, apparently I was supposed to print out the email that they sent because mm. it says to present the email when you get there to me, that means show it on my phone. Right. But immediately watching, he's like, where's the email? And I was like, uh, right here, right? Like, what are you talking about? Is it, like, you didn't print it? It's like, well, that's a shit start. And just like, yeah. literally wow. called, called me stupid. Like, like you know, oh whatever he could do to try to get me to crack. I think that was, you know, the goal. Wow. But I didn't. There's a, there's a really hilarious video that just surfaced on YouTube, I think, that I'll have to share with you that uh, I think it's specifically about Spain because here it's notorious, like, the going, I'm going through my visa renewal process as we speak as well. And, uh, it's just a, it's, it's a comically frustrating situation because there's always some, you know, you're, 
you're supposed to staple the papers on the top right corner, not the top left corner or, you know, something like yeah. stupid like that. You have to get some bank, you have to get, they really like stamps here. They stamp a lot of documents. And if you got the wrong color stamp or the wrong stamp from the wrong place or whatever, uh, it can just really derail the whole process. So this video just came out kind of like parodying that and it's, it's pretty spot on and hilarious. So your situation sounds a lot more frustrating than that though, but it's, it's good for people to know that that that's part of the process that you do have to go through that. Well, and I would want to say, well, I'll give you one more example too. He said, come back at 2 PM for the results. I sit outside of his office. There's a little waiting area outside of his office. 153. I get there. He looks over at me, just goes, what time did I tell you to come back? I was like, <laughs> two. And he's like, what time is it now? 154. He's like, get out. <laughs> I was like, what? You gotta be kidding. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. And then, uh, so I, I want to say another two things about that. One is I'm privileged and super lucky because if that's what I have to go through to move to Mexico and, and it takes one day for that process. And then, you know, the other things that I've done took the course of a few months, but really was not that bad. Super lucky, super grateful. So I really don't want to spin this into like poor me, pity me, right? right? Because just trying to get to the U.S., just trying to get into the U.S. at all, I know is a, a huge struggle for, for, for people. So I, I, I want to recognize that privilege and, and just, man, yeah. I, I've got it easy in that way. So in no way do I want to complain it's more just some observations about the process for anybody who wants to go through it uh there's also other people have said las vegas or orlando are easier as far as the consulates mm -hmm. that i might have just gotten a guy who was you know not yeah. great it's great of you to to recognize that i mean if we look at the disaster that is the case just north of the mexican border and people, you know, fighting for their lives to cross that border and what they go through. Yeah. Like, it's fun to joke about sometimes as, as expats right. living in other countries and the processes you go through, but always with it in the back of your mind that like you're, you're privileged to have the ability to choose and, yeah. to, and to just, you know, much less to have gotten through the process, but just to have the ability to say, I think I'd like to live here and not like I have to, or I can never return to my country. So there's, yeah, that's, that's great, great point. And I think, definitely uh worth worth mentioning one other question on the visa thing real quick is yeah. if you wanted to like like you you got this particular visa but if you just wanted to show up to mexico is it true you can stay for six months like without yeah. anything okay yeah let me talk about that for a sec so uh just just showing up on a tourist visa you get six months um now with my temporary residency i basically have a year but i can also renew it here mm -hmm. so I renew it and then it goes for three more years and then I get permanent residency. So I actually don't have, I technically wouldn't have to leave at all. Gotcha. At, at yeah. this point. I will That's be good. visiting. So, so some, somebody that was like six, like wanted to come for six months, try it out, see what yeah. they like it. Then yeah. the process from there would be you either have to return to your home country. Or you can go. So a lot of, what a lot of people do is if they don't want to do the whole I mean, some people might be here for a year, right? And then they want to go mm -hmm. somewhere else and they don't see Mexico as the long term, but they see it as kind of the now term. You could just do a visa run and and leave for, I think, a week or maybe even less. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've never actually done it, but I, I know some people who've done it and they, you know, leave and come back and their six months restarts. Yeah. Um, and actually that's a, you know, that's a pretty common and pretty, you know, even the, immigration officer was like why don't you just leave and come back he was just like all pissed off at me for <laughs> why are you wasting my time all you have to do yeah. is leave and come back every six like, months man i was like in my head i was like don't you want people to move here like do it le legit i don't know it was just and then there was the whole remote work thing which uh, you know you're not supposed to be working in mexico right but part of what's happened is and this is an even broader conversation about what's happening in the world which I can't wait to interview you about, but um, <laughs> there's countries are going to be becoming more open to people moving there because they see the value of having a digital nomad inject the capital into their, their economy. So that was the situation this time for me. But I think in the future, what we're going to see is, you know, countries like Barbados, for instance, 
who mm-hmm. has the digital nomad visa. I have a friend who did that and he said they were so nice. Like they want you guys, they yeah. want you there. They're like, please come live here. And they appreciate you. And they have like a whole Slack channel where, you know, it's like, like Gonzalo, right. He's got the digital nomad village in, in Madeira. It's like that country wants pe- that they want this economy boost. They want people to come and live there, enjoy, you know, the fruits of that country. Yeah. I think more and more countries are going to realize like, that's what we have to do to compete. Like, yeah this whole new wave of the way people work is creating a new type of person, a new persona of a traveler, nomad, long-term person. Like in the past year here, I was talking to real estate folks that I've never seen this many six month, one year contracts ever. Mm. So that is just the reality of, of what's it's the happening. new normal. Yeah. It's this, this movement's literally changing international law, like people like new yeah. visas, new, new residency, like these things are emerging, you know, Greece is talking about it. Estonia did it a while back, but you know, Greece yep. is doing it now Barbados. You've got other countries, Bermuda, Spain, the reason. Dubai. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, are you part of Plumia? No, no. You okay. shared that with me actually. Yeah. So like the, the, the concept of Plumia and, and you should definitely apply if you, if you want yeah. to be there's just they're doing like random updates and we haven't really gotten into the 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 full range of what this is going to be but it's it's basically the idea of establishing a country online yeah. that that worries less about these physical borders that we've constructed as a society and more so figuring out how can we level the playing field for people that are looking to travel and work remotely and 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 have some sort of status with an online country that gives them access to different physical locations and i think that that's man that that could be such an interesting future you have all these countries who have a central relationship with an organization to administer their digital nomad visa or some sort of you know regulatory like all the law and regulation is so far behind technology yeah exactly has to be some sort of change here yeah, that, that, I'm, I'm very, very intrigued by this. I feel like we could probably do, we'll have to let that simmer and do a whole nother episode on, on just on that because it's really interesting. It's going to be cool to see how that evolves. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you should get the guys who are running it. Yeah. Thunder from Safety Wing. And there, there's a, a couple other folks from their team that are heading it up. Super cool. Jordan, man, I wish we could just keep going for forever. I know we both have uh, <laughs> real, real work to get back to so that my yeah. side project doesn't become uh, a hindrance on, uh, on the real right. work, I guess. And the bosses do actually care, but this has been so fun. I've, I've been excited to, to finally get a chance to sit down with you and learn a little bit more about your history. And I think people are going to walk away with a ton of insightful knowledge about how to prepare themselves for getting remote work if they want to move to Mexico. Just just a lot of good info shared here and personally just a bunch of fun for me. So when we yeah what a blast. Thanks so much for for having me on here. If anybody's interested in, in learning more connecting, you know, I'm op- super open to connecting on LinkedIn. It's the easiest yeah. way. And, uh, and do it right, people. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say practice your outreach skills and I'm happy to, you know, give you some pointers and and uh, you know I, I I love what I do. I love being able to help people. So I hope that this was, was helpful. Yeah. I'm positive that it was, like I said, even, even for me, like I, I was taking some good mental notes here and if you will, we'll put all this in the show notes, but just plug away uh, a couple of like the main website to go to. And, and yeah. I mentioned YouTube is the best social handle, but any others you want to share here, go for it. Yeah. The remote job coach.com. It's going to have everything. It's going to be your ability to navigate to me however you need to. Go there. Find it, people. (laughs) Awesome. Thanks so much, Jordan, man. Look forward to catching up next time. All right, Chase, brother. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in today from wherever you are in the world. Once again, I'm Chase, and this has been another episode of About Abroad. You can visit aboutabroad.com to get our latest updates and listen to past episodes or find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, uh, really anywhere you get your podcasts. On that note, if you enjoyed the show, feel free to subscribe and if inclined, leave a few stars and a review. It's truly, truly appreciated and will help more wanderers just like you find us. Until the next time, adios from España.